Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, special occasion today in an unusual setting. It's actually the first time ever that I'm uh, at the graduation presentation in, in this venue. Um, which is already in itself quite an accomplishment. Well, I think you're all here for the graduation of Miki Linskens, uh, which I have a privilege uh, to chair uh, today. I will start with a quick introduction just to tell you a little bit about the context of today. So as you know, Miki is hopefully going to graduate today. Woo! <laughs> as a Master of Science, we're not there yet, so there's Let's not celebrate yet, and anything can still happen. Um, and my name is, uh, by the way, Thomas Jaskiewicz. Uh, I'm, uh, I've been, I had the privilege of being the chair of Mickey's uh, project. Uh, I'm here, a design fellow of this faculty, and I'm joined today by my uh, colleague, Milena Gonzalez, uh, uh, the mentor in the project, and two representatives of the Funk Rotterdam, Eert and uh, Mike. Uh, who have been uh, supervising Miki from the site of the municipality of Rotterdam. Um, so, uh, the plan for today is actually quite straightforward. Miki will start with half an hour of a presentation to share with you what he's been working on over the past five plus months or so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's been a lot. So, so, brace yourselves. It's going to be a, a long but exciting story. After that, there will be room for you to ask questions. For everything that you want to understand, uh, you can ask for clarifications. And please don't take it easy on him, because uh, a challenging question also gives him the opportunity to shine and, and show uh, all the things that obviously are not possible to present in, in half an hour only. So, so challenge him with your questions. After that, we'll recess. We'll try not to take too long to, together with Miki, drill him with even tougher questions. So if you don't ask tough, tough questions, we will. And uh, see if he meets all the graduation criteria for a <coughs> near Master of Science uh, title here at the faculty. I will come down uh, here uh, to you with the final verdict. And hopefully, then there will be a moment to congratulate Miki on his new title. That's it for me. Mickey, the floor is yours. This is the M-Drop Junk Playground. It's designed by a Danish architect. And before he designed this, he made a playground. Great. <laughs> uh, he, made, he made playgrounds for kids, regular, traditional playgrounds. And the kids didn't play in them. So then in 1943, he designed this playground, 6,000 meters of uh, square land, and he put all kinds of junk there. So he called it the junk and junk playground. Car tires, broken cars, tools, wood, mud, and it was super successful. Even now, there are still so-called adventure playgrounds all over the world, even in Rotterdam, in the Spildernis, where, where I used to play when I was young. So why? Does our faculty, filled with creative kids, look like this? Mm -hmm. White tables, laptops on the computers, no clay, no sand, no screwdrivers. And shouldn't a creative space where you would, are creative look like this? Or offices look like this, where play is part of your work? So with this belief that this is important, I came to do a project at full. This presentation will be structured into six parts. First, I will talk about FUNC, what, it, what they are, uh, then about the prototype I made, about research, the validation through experts, uh, the final roadmap, and recommendations to FUNC. So let's begin with FUNC. Who are they? This is them. Two of them are in the, in the hall now. So, um, FUNC is an initiative of innovative people within the municipality of Rotterdam. And what they're trying to do is organizing events to stimulate innovation within their network. Their network is called the Innovation Network Rotterdam and consists of 2,500 people, not only civil servants, but also civilians, artists, entrepreneurs, and what so on. An example which showcases, for me at least, what FUNC does very well is their collaboration with Mona Lisa's. That's an art collective from Rotterdam, and they organized an event called Deep Fried Memes. 
in this event, they highlighted that memes are not only funny, but also what their wider impact is on society and the city of Rotterdam. So this is an example of what they want to do. They also have a known space with uh, an extended reality room, which VR lenses, with very heavy computers for 3D rendering. They have a workshop space with 3D printers. They have a living room at the bottom right, and of course, a ping pong table. So they do a lot very well already. And there are already is, uh, is some successful stories. However, they still struggle with actively involving their network in hands-on innovation activities. One of the first days that I was at Funk, there was a group of students and they explained what Funk was and what innovation was. And then when the tour and the talk was done, the students went on their laptop again, checking their mail. So actual prototyping or interacting with the st cool stuff they have, they wanted more than it's go going on now. So normally, a designer from this faculty would implement the double diamond method very often. We have learned that past the seven years that I've studied here. And you start in the problem space and then go to the solution space. Typically, you find, find out more about the problem of Funk and then define what the actual problem is, then come up with some ideas and find one solution. I discovered during this project that naturally I work the other way around. Yes, there will be animations in this presentation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I start with a solution. A great example is that when my roommates were sitting here, they come home and they hate it when then all of a sudden I've changed the layout of the whole living room. Not because the living room was bad, because, but just because I wanted the table closer to the window. So I think in solutions and not immediately in problems. So let's focus on the prototype because what I did, I came up with an initial solution. First, I quickly researched about play and innovation, what, how you can stimulate it and what's going on there. And I discovered that there's an overlap in these two, which is making. Making is both part of constructive play where you, for example, build three houses. And it's also part of innovation in the form of prototyping or experimenting. Um, so I just took making as my solution and started to work. Made some drawings, uh, discussed with Funk what they liked about these. And then I'll just grab materials from the street because I couldn't spend any money. Um, and I built the prototype in two days. This is my favorite picture. With a car will go bike, I just uh, cycled around Rotterdam and he got pallets and car tires and stuff. So then started building in Funk. It was a Friday, so nobody was bothered. That was nice. And this was the final result. This design consists of a wooden wall, a wooden table, a carpet to protect the floor, uh, storage for tools to use to, for making, a display area for past work of makers, um, modular furniture in the form of a table, and um, material storage with some scrap materials. Well, then I observed this for a few weeks, what happened? And the result, there was some success, but designing the space was not the solution. Uh, not everybody was making yet at Funk. So some successes. Success one, Gerard, here in the front, uh, just after my prototype was done, I accidentally had one board which was hanging on an angle. So out of irritation, Gerard took a drill, drilled a screw in the wall, and it was straight again. So this is, for me, was some form of play. Another form of play from the team of Funk is also just after it was finished, they took some clay, they made a clay dartboard and started throwing clay against the wall. So it was like, this is working. This is what I think that play is. The results. I participated as well, by the way. Another result which was not in the team of Funk was an externally organized design thinking workshop. Right after my midterm, a few people came together and learned about design thinking. And they used my prototype exactly for what it was intended for. So they used scrap materials to build ideas which were already in their heads uh, to ex explain them to other people. But most of the time, the prototype still looked like this, empty. Not every visitor of Funk was still making and hands-on practicing innovation through that making. So what do these users of Funk, these visitors, these people from that network actually need to be innovative or to make more? I didn't know that. I just made this prototype from my own intuition. Um, 
And therefore, I need to do research. And hold on tight, because this is going to be a little bit the difficult part. Um, so yeah, I needed to more, know more about theory. What does theory tell me about how play works, how you can stimulate innovation, about design of the space? And what uh, does Funk want? How do they see making in their, within their vision? And users, what do they need? Because I focused in my prototype a lot on woodworking, but maybe that's not their type of, type of making. The goal of this research, because it leads to a lot of data, I did around 18 interviews, which resulted in around 1,000 uh, quotations, quotes. So I want to reduce this complexity for my project, but also for you. And I did this by context structuring through the VIP method, step three, a famous design method in Delft. I'll walk you very shortly through these steps, and then I'll explain each step in more detail. So first, the theory, I did a literature review, and this resulted in a two-dimensional framework. Then I had a co-creation session with Funk, which led, which led to some opportunities of making, and I had user interviews, which led to opportunity and threat zones uh, connected to innovation and making. So these were plotted on the framework, as you can see on the top right. Then the combination of all these things, the framework and the opportunity zones, is a route uh, towards success, hopefully. And this route actually is the basis of a roadmap. <laughs> so let's start with the theoretical framework. So in the literature review, I look towards concepts of play, innovation, space design, uh, how making works, and even how creativity works in a little bit. And that out of this research came a lot of insights. I clustered these insights on themes and what they had to do with each other. And this led to this two-dimensional framework I was talking about. This is kind of giving the picture of all the data of the literature research that I have in one visual. So on the horizontal axis, you have the space design part, which I addressed in my prototype, environment. It goes all the way from a comfortable environment, like traditional municipal spaces with traditional norms and, and values, which is comfortable for a civil servant. And then on the right, it goes to a challenging environment, which is specifically designed so that the person is took out of their comfort zone. And on the other axis, the vertical one, you have creativity. The variable here is time. So at the bottom, you have the first stages of the creative process, for example, initial ideas or ideation. And on the top part, you have more working towards a final concept, so later in the creative process. I use this framework to plot all my research data, the, the interview insights, so that I could compare them not only to literature, but also to each other based on literature. So now I'll explain how I came from an interview towards a zone, which I briefly mentioned, which is plotted on the framework. So for this example, I will explain uh, the phone call creation session, how that worked, but it works the same way for the user interviews. So this was co-creation session with Funk. I asked them, what do, do you think about making? How could making be of benefit for Funk? And that led to some insights in the form of quotes. These quotes then like there were 160 quotes for one co-creation session, but for the example, these quotes are part of two uh, clusters. And these clusters are then plotted on the framework. So then I could compare them to the theory. The co-creation session of Funk resulted in this. So all the 160 quotes are plotted in clusters on the framework, and that leads to the green zone, which represents rough, roughly, thus with less complexity, how Funk thinks about making. So I did this as well for all the user interviews. And what I'm going to do now is explain how I interpret the location of these zones to go to the uh, route I talked about. So first I asked both Funk and the users, what is your definition of making? What do you think that making is? What do you understand that making is for you? And that resulted in two main themes. Making is visualizing, visualizing your thoughts, bringing your ideas into reality, 
And making can be anything. It can be making a story or making with wood or with clay or by discussing with people. Um, so these are just two examples within that gray area. And the cool thing is this really overlaps with how Hong thinks about making. Um, and that learns me that this point where nu is written, which is now, um, is the current situation. Currently, there's a mutual understanding about making between both Funk and their users. Great, a good place to start from. Then we needed to know where do we want to go away from the current situation. So therefore I asked the users and Funk, what could be, how could making be a benefit towards your work? So what could making eventually lead to? And that led to these two blue benefit zones. The top one, uh, an example of, uh, of a benefit that users mentioned was that making helps to solve problems. And the bottom one is that making is a fun and satisfying process and therefore it's beneficial. However, I already have to erase one of these uh, sections, the top right one. There are three reasons for this. First, you can see that it's not in line with Funk's vision. So it's away from their scope and therefore maybe not so relevant. Also, this is where my prototype was also located, actively adapting the space and focusing on final concept creation about bringing your ideas to life. And my prototype didn't solve everything, so it might not be the best thing to focus further on. And lastly, there is a huge barrier there. The users told me that the municipality has a very rigid culture with not enough flexibility for them to make. That's how they feel. Um, and I think that this is a huge barrier to overcome. So I didn't address it in this project. But can we go directly towards the bottom right section? Well, I don't think so. Because I also asked the users, how can I stimulate you or how can Funk stimulate you to make more, to be more innovative? Um, and as you can see, those are the yellow opportunity zones. So this is locations where people think that they could be stimulized for innovation and the direct route avoids two of these very great zones. So examples of what these zones are is the top left is a can-do mentali mentality stimulates the users for making, then uh, freedom, even in like just freedom from their superiors or freedom in the space that they have space to move and they have the things to work with can stimulate making. And then lastly, inspiration and tools can stimulate making. For example, seeing another person make something can be really inspiring for yourself to make. So I'll advise the route to go towards these stimuli zones. However, you need to be aware of the barriers that the users also mentioned. And these are two important ones. The left side, you have the bureaucratic resistance to change. So don't move too far to that side. And then at the bottom side, you have the fact that creativity is still quite new within the municipal system. So therefore, it's quite fragile. People, for example, have a fear of judgment or a fear of failure. And well, there are more psychological factors which are in this barrier zone at the bottom. Therefore, I would advise not to go there. Be aware of these two. You cannot go directly. So go like this through those making stimulus zones. Um, and this line from which is based on the theory and on research on Funk and on research on users still looks quite abstract, but it also represents uh, quite concrete steps. So for example, first, you would be moving more towards, I would advise Funk to act more within the traditional space. So currently they are targeting very creative people, but they can also target traditional a little bit more traditional people in a traditional context. Then I would advise them to focus more on the early pro parts of the creative process than they are doing now. And then gradually they can make the environment of the users increasingly more challenging for them. And hopefully this will lead towards innovation. So note this route that I've presented based on all this research is a road towards innovation and not yet towards play. 
that will come later in the form of ideas. First, oh yeah, well done. This was the difficult part. You made it <laughs> and I made it. <laughs> so the validation. Um, I've interviewed three experts within the municipality, two strategists and one which is a part of an exemplary project for FUNC, which is quite similar. And these experts confirmed my route. The interviews that I had with them had somewhat of the same points or even conf explicitly confirmed what the users were saying. So that's great. But they also gave me more. Rijenwoord Plus, which is a, a, a project which is quite similar to what Funk is doing and already also has a lot of great success stories. Um, for example, this, the Nachtclub, which is also somewhat in collaboration with Funk. Um, and they, she told me, the person I interviewed, that they had one big advantage why they were successful. And that was a big goal. They had a big goal to work towards. Because Rijenwoord, a neighborhood in Rotterdam, had a sewer replacement planned in a few years. So Rijenwoord Plus could take that opportunity to imp implement more innovative ideas because the street would be open and the, it would be a large mess so they could do stuff. So this big goal was, a, was one of their most important drivers towards innovation. And the other two experts who are really experienced in municipal processes, they implicitly provided me with a goal. For Kogering, or in English, compartmentalization. Apparently, within the municipality, at the top of the hierarchy, um, within teams, there all the all the ideas which for projects are divided into separate projects in, well, cokers or compartments. And these separate projects never work together again. Well, very often not. So this compartmentalization is a huge issue and I will explain why. For example, Rotterdam wants to do a lot with, it, with its roofs. So some people want to install solar panels or water storage or plantation or greenhouses. So in the top of the hierarchy, a lot of projects are started to do these things. But these separate projects all assume that they could use all of the space of the roofs because they never communicated to each other. And therefore, a lot of double work was done and a lot of value were lost because these projects were not overlapping and not built upon each other or with each other. So that's a bummer and a big problem. And I will suggest that Funk can utilize this goal. Because now the goal of FUNC is we want to increase innovation. But as Rai or Plus told me, you need a specific goal to hold on to, a strict deadline like a sewer. So I would say you can use innovation to fight compartmentalization. And that is a clear goal to hold on to. This goal um, was a general team for creating my roadmap and helped in creating these steps. So it is in each step of the roadmap. Um, a roadmap, by the way, is a strategic tool, a strategic planning tool. So if you have a strategy, you can create a roadmap to hold on to that strategy. And I divided my roadmap into four steps. Yes, great. Uh, and these four steps are called horizons. I want to explain each of this four, these four horizons with one idea, which is playful. Um, and which I would, which I selected especially for full, like this. But first, <laughs> we need a little sidetrack because how did I come up with the, uh, these ideas and why are they valuable? I ended up with four playful ideas, one for each each part of the horizon. First, throughout my whole process, I collected more than 150 ideas in the form of drawings or notes. Then I went to places where creativity is already successfully nurtured, mostly with kids. So the Ondek Fabriek in Eindhoven is this example. Chris is sitting over there. Uh, and I interviewed him for an hour and he showed everything around and I made pictures. And I did the same for uh, with the Spildernis, the Baukate, Keinewerf, and a few other places. So these led to more inspirational ideas. Then I projected all these ideas on my framework to see how they fit my roadmap, which ideas were actually applicable to each horizon. Then I filtered the ideas so they were suited for Vogue, 
because I don't have to, well, execute these ideas, but the team of Funk does. So I had another co-creation session and I asked them, what do you like to do? And I chose ideas based on that information. And then finally, I made these ideas playful. So very briefly, because play is quite difficult, how can you make an idea playful? Well, at the core, play is purposeless. People only play, or children only play, because they like to play. So it's an end in itself. And the thing about play is it's a balance between reality and imagination, which you constantly switch in between. So for example, for a kid, a cardboard box, which is real, can turn in his imagination to a helicopter. So this is what play is about. And um, if a person is afraid to play or doesn't know how to, you can apply some guidance, but know that this freedom guidance balance is very fragile. Ideally, you would have all the freedom because then you have that balance of imagination and reality. But if you apply very uh, delicate guides, then play can feel more safe and more productive towards a goal, which we kind of need for fun. But if you apply too many guides, play becomes a game, which is not the same. Game uses play, but it's not the raw form of play that I talk about and that so effectively stimulates creativity. So that added me up with four ideas, one for each roadmap, filtered for the team of Funk, and made playful. Let's start with Horizon 1. So Horizon 1 will be finding connectors within the municipality. As an expert told me, there are creative people in the municipality, but they just don't know each other yet. So find these people, and I would advise to find them within compartmentalized projects. Um, a playful way to do this for phone could be to, in one of their rooms, install a detective board with a lot of projects, a lot of people, and pin them down and connect them with wire or with anything, any other material. Then for Horizon 2, was it a quick, there you go. Um, I would advise to teach these connectors that you have found to overcome compartmentalization. So, um, the idea that I had with this is Funk Academy, and it goes two ways. On the one hand, you will train the Funk team so they are able to guide these people, because as you might remember, guidance is very delicate when you want to create something playful. And you want to teach the users of Funk, those connectors, how they can utilize innovative processes to battle compartmentalization within their separate projects. So when they, those people know how to do that, you can move on to Horizon 3. This one is about facilitating groups of these connectors. Um, ideally, for example, a group of all the people within those rooftop, rooftop projects to implement innovative processes to actually fight a little part of the compartmentalization within their projects. So connect those projects in between. And I would advise that Funk here takes a project management role. As we have in this study association, you have a board which has a high bird's eye view and you have separate committees. So those groups could be committees who have an executive role on fixing the compartmentalization and FUNC will guard the strategy and facilitate meetings and provide the users what they need. And then lastly, to reach innovation, I would advise to celebrate these projects that you will start up in the third horizon that they are successful. So I envision a Funk festival or Funk fair where each project will have a separate stand in which they present how they use innovation to actually solve a part of compartmentalization. So celebrate this success of innovation. And hopefully if you follow these horizons, this will be a roadmap towards innovation through playful concepts. And notice, Nothing, I will move on. <laughs> so then, the last part, recommendations. First, a general recommendation is try to move towards a yearly cycle. So don't have one festival and then call it a day, but try to iterate on this process so you have a yearly festival. That looks like this. Um, so after the first festival, you will run through these horizons within one year each year. The three more specific recommendations from my report were choose a focus. It doesn't have to be compartmentalization. I think it's really cool. 
but it can be anything, but a clear focus to hold on to for Funk. Then iterate on my horizons. While doing these horizons, try to very, very often evaluate and see how you can improve it, because then after the first festival, you can do a yearly festival, because you can speed up. up. And then lastly, first try to, in the first horizon, get these people and then put them together because their needs for being innovative will rise to the surface very quickly when you just put them in a room. And then when you know more about these people, you can take my research again and see what kind of stimuli or barriers may be applicable to that group of people because I don't know them yet in person. And if you do this, if you create this iterative uh, horizons, then maybe eventually you will have so many successful projects fighting compartmentalization that you can actually transform these initial ideas at the bottom of the framework to more final concepts to actually battle compartmentalization on a larger scale. And as you might remember, there was a huge barrier here. But I believe if you follow this roadmap and have a yearly festival, then maybe you can break this rigid culture of the municipality, which doesn't leave for much innovation. And then just maybe in 10 years or so, when you had many festivals and success stories, then you can change the entire organizational culture using that play infused innovation that I've been talking about. And then the municipality can lose all the comp compartmentalization, be a network oriented structure and use these playful ideas to help Rotterdam deal with its future. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, sorry for the wait. It took us a bit longer than anticipated, and we did have a very, very challenging, difficult, actually not so difficult, uh, but different than anticipated discussion with Mickey and uh, five of us. Um, so before I make the announcements, I'll, I'll keep you a little bit in, in the insecure zone because I have to explain ourselves. I mean, it's, uh, it's been a, quite an unusual process for a graduation student that Mickey has uh, gone through. I mean, uh, quite, I mean, he's a maker and I, I'm actually a maker as well. So I felt a click and I kind of really liked that he started, that he wanted to start building right away. And, uh, and then he, and he did it, right? I mean, you saw in the pictures, I mean, Within a few weeks, there was already uh, stuff happening, uh, wood coming in, and there was a table. But hey, where's science in that? It's a master of science project, right? So we need we needed to think hard how to combine that making with research, right? And at some point, this whole idea of inverted diamond came up, right? It's a whole new method to sort of make it work for Mickey, actually, <laughs> right? To build first and then do research. Right. It's supposed to be that way. Right? And, uh, <laughs> I was like, okay, okay, that sounds like a good idea. So he'll build a table and then evaluate it, right? People like the table or not, and, and, and then conclude with some recommendations for even better table, right? But but no, right? And you've, you've seen it. That's not how it went. I mean, he, he went full on and basically devised a plan to change the whole municipality, right? And curiously enough, the municipality actually likes that plan. <laughs> so that's that's or it tells tells Starting already tomorrow. something, right? I mean, there, it might not be as easy as it sounded in the presentation, but it says something about the the possible impact and the relevance of all the research and all the thoughts and all the insights that came from uh, from Nikki's work. Uh, Let's say that the research in Mickey's report, if you care to read it, hasn't been kosher at all levels, right? Uh, but I think it's uh, it's the uh, it's reaching the goal, right? That that really counts in this context. It's uh, it's creating this amazing presentation, and hopefully, you know, inspiring all of you to be a little bit more playful in your work as well. So, Mickey, thanks for that, and. Um, with that, okay, I'm not going to keep you waiting any, any longer. Uh, 
we're really happy and honored to be able to award Mickey today with the double title, Master of Science and an Engineer. Woo! double-sided certificate, uh, which might be a good moment for for a photo. And I'm not sure what's the good place to do it, but I mean, it's, uh, let's make it playful on the bar. <laughs> There's a pen. Mickey, there is one. Oh, Moya. <laughs> Wait, I want to practice it first. <laughs> you can use this one for the photo and then swap for a different one. Yeah, let's do it. Bedankt dat jullie allemaal waren, super leuk om zoveel mensen te zien. En ik ben uh, erg blij dat ik de presentatie ging. En uh, ook met het cijfer, ik ging uit van een 6. Dus bedankt iedereen die me geholpen heeft met, ja, bij, deze, bij deze dingen. Uh, het was een zwaar proces. <lacht> ik ben blij dat ik eindelijk ja, stop met studeren. <lacht> uh, en ik had nog wat, uh, wat leuks bedacht in het kader van mijn project. Want op het einde van... Het project realiseerde, ging ik meer onderzoek naar doen naar spel. Ja, op het einde zat ik echt nog papers te lezen van, nou is het echt zo. En toen realiseerde ik me dus dat dat spel, dat, dat helemaal geen doel heeft. En ik heb dus tijdens mijn afstuderen de hele tijd geprobeerd om zelf te spelen. Ik weet niet of iemand Scarface kent, die film, maar hij, ja, don't get high in your own supply. Dus ik heb spel proberen te onderzoeken en tegelijkertijd te spelen, maar dat werkt dus niet. Want spel is doelloos. Je moet dat alleen doen omdat je spel leuk vindt. Dus mochten jullie dit cool vinden wat ik heb verteld en dat spel inspirerend vinden, dan zou ik zeggen, ga niet per se op zoek naar spel. Ga niet per se spel implementeren in je designmethodes of wat dan ook. Um, maar ga het leren herkennen. En dan als je het herkent, geniet er dan van. En ik vind spel zelf echt super cool. Dus misschien ga ik ermee door en ik ga zeker opletten of ik er nog meer over kan leren. Maar tot die tijd geniet ervan, als je het herkent. En over vijf jaar misschien kan ik je wel uitleggen hoe het echt moet. <lacht> dus ja, de borrel uh, is volgens mij begonnen. De eerste 147 bier zijn van mij. Wow. Uh, en ja, uh, het duurt tot negen en verder... Uh, dat is het. <lacht> 